Guys, I'd love to, um, I guess everybody just put themselves on mute um, during this, or obviously you don't have to if you want to speak up, but as Corbett, he's just going to go through and give a little bit of a presentation, um, speak to a couple of things. I noticed a couple of you that are on here that know him. Feel free to jump in and kind of help with some of these frequently asked questions around uh, processing equipment and farming and so forth. And then as people come on, I'll just continue to add them at the end, uh, depending on where we're at with time. Um, after his presentation, I'll go through some of the questions you guys submitted upon registration. But then if you guys have specifics that maybe weren't touched on or that you'd like to ask, feel free to jump in and do so as well. Um, does that work, Corbett? Fine by me. Okay, perfect. <coughs> I'm going to put up a presentation that I'll do tomorrow. And I've done, I've done this quite a bit because I hadn't seen or still haven't seen people talking about the actual financial performance of him as it relates to revenue per acre for farms. So I'll, I'll put this up and I'm just going to kind of go through it a little fast, a little quick. You can always hit me up after the fact and if you want more detail of it, because there's a pile of questions there that I want to make sure we have enough time to do. And if you got any questions, just stop and, and ask me. I'm always flexible. I'm not a very formal person. Let me do this. From current. So Corbett Hefner, uh, VP of, of Formation Ag shareholder, and I, I basically take care of that and run the show there and make things work and it do a lot of the innovation, a lot of the business development. Um, I've been thrust into sales, which is not my favorite by any means, but we do it because it helps solve problems for people and that's that's what we've been doing. Um, we started out as Power Zone Agriculture in end of 2015. 2016, uh, 17, I came in and started with the harvesters. That was the exact time that CBD harvesting really started to take off. So we made some, uh, that one's supposed to happen. Wrong way. Why are you not going? There you go. We made some harvesting equipment for whole plant harvesting. And then now we've gotten into, uh, we can strip the buds for CBD or grain um, this picture in the top right hand corner is one of our clean strip machines with a, with a grasshopper, which is a chaff or bud collection cart that we build. Um, we've got flower stem separation stuff for CBD equipment. This lower right hand corner is if you've got a, a crop that you want to get seed out of, you know, flower, CBD flower that's got a seed in it. Uh, we can extract that seed, clean the seed, size it, and then collect all the, the keef and, and flower material. So we make a, a wide range of machinery for people, um, but that's not what we're talking about here. Um, I'll kind of skip over this. Most people understand, and th this is going to be focused on grain and fiber at the moment. And that's just a few of the different uses for those products. You know, the, you, people say there's 10, 20,000 uses for hemp. Uh, most of them, in my opinion, after doing this for the last several years, uh, are related to the stem and, and stock, so the herd and the fiber. So that, that's really important uh, to understand that, you know, most of the major uses to me anyway, especially for larger scale agriculture, are going to come from the fiber and the herd. Um, we built the first decorticator in the U.S. Uh, last part of 2015, 2016, um, that was based off of Slickton's machine that started the marijuana tax back way back in the good old days. Um, you can read through this thing, but, you know, just like in CBD, we see start with a sale and work backwards. Where are you going to take this crops so that you can actually make some money off of it? You know, you got all those great uses, but if you can't monetize it and you can't make any, any money on it, what's, what's kind of the, the business risk for it? And can you stomach that? Um, I always tell people, you know, only plant what you can, can, can afford to turn under. So this is kind of farmer focused right here now. And you can ask me other questions for the downstream processes because we work on that quite a bit too. Um, you know, understand the market. That's one thing. People want to decorticate or they want to grow fiber. They want to grow grain. But, you know, just like CBD, I'm, I'm, I have a little bit of concern for people overplanting, having way too many acres and are not a home for it. And then all of a sudden the price is going to drop out just like CBD. If you don't have a place for fiber and grain, then you need to really be careful thinking about if that's something you want to put in the ground. Because uh, you see what happened to CBD in the last, you know, 14, 18 months and the price for that. 
Um, so make sure you got a home for it. I mean, the, the grain will store a little bit, the fiber can store, but you know, if you can't monetize it and get something done here with it, then it's kind of, it's kind of an effort and futility if you don't have your crop sold. Um, just depends on what your disposable income is and what you want to hang on to, uh, but really understand that. And then really have a good conversation with the people that you are going to sell to, not only to them, but ask them, you know, you're trying to get a sell for your crop. But if that person that's contracting you to grow that acreage, if they don't have a home for it, you better know, you, you know, that's an okay question to ask. What are you going to do with it? Do you have it? Do you have it sold? I didn't even click the button and it moved forward. A little bit about fiber and grain. I don't know what the, the audience so much here, but um, fiber, I still like to decorticate redded crops more than others. Uh, we just see much, much better separation. The crops are dry. People like to ask about green decortication. And I ask them, how are you going to dry your fiber? How are you going to dry that herd once it's broken down? It's an organic compound. If it's not dry, it will mold, it will mildew, and eventually it will catch on fire. So be aware of that. Um, we, we've broken down some CBD type Christmas tree things. They don't make very good fiber because everywhere there's a, there's a branch, there's a node, and that's a weak point. If you're doing something that does not require a lot of tensile strength, you can get away with it. But you really got to understand what your customers are doing with it. Um, you know, how are you going to store this crop? Try to keep it from getting too wet. Uh, where we live, our farmers have the ability to store stuff outside because we're quite dry. Uh, but we do bring the fiber in and let it dry for three or four days before we, we uh, decorticate it because we can decorticate pretty well in the 10, 12 percent moisture range. But we found where the bales are sitting outside, uh, they'll be at 10 to 10 percent moisture or lower. We bring them inside after a day or two when they warm up. I don't know if it's condensation from them being cold, et cetera, but the moisture content will shoot up into the 24, 28 range, which just makes it a little bit more difficult to decorticate. We can do it, but it, you know the jams, the plug ups are a little bit more difficult. So we just let them sit for a little bit and dry out. And then you know, try to make sure you know when they can take the material. Um, at the moment, round baling, especially from a long line fiber, perspective is is easier than square baling because square bales uh, some of those machines have little chopper mechanisms before it goes into the compression chamber that can cut the fiber remember any any impact on that strand of fiber can be a damage uh, if anybody's coming to the show or wants to come to the shop i can show you every place where if a crop got rotary mode instead of sickle harvested where there's been an impact and it's a damage in the fiber um most people wouldn't know that unless you came out of the textile industry. Grain, same kind of thing. Try to get it clean before you put it in the bin. Try to get it dry. Um, but I'm going to jump over to some of this because this is kind of what I really wanted to get to. How much money can is, is possible in this? These numbers up here are a scenario for a customer we did. Uh, the contract's for 2,500 acres, uh, 2.5 million pounds. Convention or organic grain is contracted at $1.10. The conventional is at 55 cents. So on a thousand acres, this, this, this genetic that they're trying to grow, its average yield is a thousand pounds an acre. So this line, right? I hope my mouse is showing up. This total revenue line, that's the total potential revenue for 1,250 acres at a buck 10 times a thousand pounds an acre. Um, I threw the seed cost in here for this, this genetic. Um, planning rate in this instance is 28 pounds. That's what they're asking for. So they need 28,000 pounds of seed for their conventional one at 25 pounds, be 25,000 uh, pounds of seed. The variable planning rate here, we had them go up a little bit because of weed pressure, just uh, organic versus conventional. If there's more weed pressure, the tighter the planting space, the more canopies, the less weed pressure in theory you should have. So I put in here then subtracting that seed cost, the gross returns minus seed be 1.2 million for the organic, 568 seed cost is here. So uh, $475 an acre to farm this. I've, if you see here, I've got input cost equal to irrigated corn. That's where those numbers came from between 475 and 500 acres, uh, $500 an acre is what it's gonna cost you to grow if you're irrigating. 
So that comes up to your farming expense of about 593. Remember that that's for 1,250 acres, 593,000 for organic, 530 for conventional. Now, if your fertility is different, of course, these numbers are going to change. I, I usually don't use input costs because it just kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of an unknown there. So, I, but I threw it in here for this scenario. Um, so that, that your estimated net per acre return in the organic would be 490 something. Look at the conventional one drops down to $29 an acre. Um, you know, so that's $36,000, $29 dollars an acre. The organic at 624, that's about 500 bucks an acre. So I just couldn't, then I took it here and broke it down into pounds, uh, just dollar, you know, dollars and cents per pound is what the return would be. Um, in this scenario, the customer asked me, hey, what's crop insurance run? So for their area, um, I called up the Hemp Flex program and a couple of the other people. This was kind of a round average, the $80 uh, per acre to 150. It's you know, very dependent on, on uh, hail events, moisture events. I was pretty impressed at uh, how detailed and how localized insurance premiums uh, varied. That was kind of surprising. Um, <clears throat> Since we're, you know, Formation Ag is really focused on fiber, I put this together with, with the idea of for various planting rates, can I predict what kind of tonnage per acre is possible? And if I can predict that, then we can kind of start to see what the fiber return, revenue return per acre is. So in this scenario, I've got my planting rates here in this column. The seed density, you know, seeds per pound I used in this scenario were 41,000. So knowing these things, I just pulled some average kind of grain yields per acre in terms of pounds into this column based on that, that density. And then I can calculate from there a plant population per acre. Now, we went out a few years ago and cut different stocks and I weighed those stocks in terms of ounces per feet. So in this scenario, I'm saying just for easy sake of conversion, that every one of these stocks in this scenario, we're only gonna get five feet of stock. You know, if you get a different genetic, maybe more or less, but this is kind of round numbers for you. So what it did there was now I know how many plants we have. Now I know how many um, stock feet per acre we're gonna have. And on another slide here, I show how many, what that weight per foot is, and then I can calculate a poundage per acre, convert that into tonnage. So in this column right here, if you plant it at 20 pounds, and these numbers, after a little more talking to different people around the country, I think this yield in terms of tonnage per fiber might be a little optimistic. I usually like to put this stuff out in a very conservative manner, but I think this is a little bit on the high side personally. It's achievable, but for estimation purpose, I, th I think this is a little high. Um, <clears throat> as a general rule of thumb, fiber is 25% of the stock and the herd is the balance. Now, the tighter you plant the crop, the more this ratio, 25 to 75, is going to shift. Uh, we saw this, this last year in a crop that was planted extremely tight, and I would say the fiber is probably 30% of the weight. So it can shift. So just be aware of that because the herd is, you know, the bulk of, of the diameter of the stem. And if you plant that tighter, uh, in this instance, there was one field that was between 70 and 100 pounds per acre. The stalks at the base were a quarter to three eighths of an inch in diameter, and the plants were over 100 inches tall. So there's not as much herd in there as you would think. Um, and keep in mind when if you're harvesting for a true fiber crop, if you don't want the grain, you harvest way before it goes to flower. And I think the, the goal there is when you harvest before it goes to seed, the lignans have not produced as heavily as, as if you let the plant go to seed and it's a little easier to break it down. Um, and then the fibers, resulting fiber is pretty decent. Down here in this lower left-hand corner is, is where I calculated the ounces per foot. So 0 0.022 ounces per foot of stock. Uh, I'm using 8% moisture. Here's this ratio, roughly three to one um, footage and poundage. Boy, this camera thing is right where I need to look for my notes. Um, <clears throat> current market prices. 
We've been buying baled material for roughly $150 a ton. Um, hoping we can get that number up a little bit. If you've ever heard or spoke to me before, I have a very vested interest in keeping farmers healthy and at $150 a ton. And if you're averaging three to four tons an acre and all you're doing is a farming crop revenue, you can kind of see where the math is at, at today's corn and wheat prices. I'm not sure if that'd be a viable uh, market, you know, at, at 150. You can make some money at it, but you know, if you're conservative, that may not be a good thing for you. Um, first mill long line fiber. We've been selling it for a little more than this for this um, discussion. I put it at $2 and 25 cents a foot or per pound, excuse me. First milled herd, 37 and a half cents per pound. When we clean and size the herd, we're in the 46 to 48 cents per pound. Uh, if we clean it, really good and size it, then we go up a little more. Then here's the, some of those gr conventional grain numbers. So just showing you, and these are, these are viable market numbers that you can grab. So it's not pie in the sky kind of stuff. So we can keep going. I'm gonna do just this last slide here and then start doing some questions. But what I'm trying to show in this slide is if you're planting a dual purpose crop, let's say, and let's say you put it in at 30 pounds per acre, that's your seeding rate. If you're growing grain at the average yield that I had on there, your, your grain per acre revenue is $687, roughly. You can estimate that you got 4.39 tons of fiber in there. And that, again, I think that's on the high side, the more we've learned here. Now I should probably go and change this. So here's your gross revenue of stock. So let's say you're a dual purpose guy. You're going to sell just fiber bales, right? And you've got the grain. This is your total revenue per acre in this scenario. It's about $1,346 an acre, okay, gross revenue. No input costs subtracted here. And that's all you wanna do. You say, I'm just gonna farm the grain and I'm gonna do the fiber and I'm stopping. That's your total potential revenue. So if somebody comes in and tell you you can make 10,000 bucks an acre farming grain, you should really be questioning it. And that's why I put this together so you can have a little bit of, of knowledge going into this beforehand and know what the potential upside is here. And then this next column is gross revenue for first mill decorticated. So let's say uh, you know, you're, you've bought one of our decorticating machines, you spent a little money on it, and you're gonna convert that, you're gonna do the value added work to decorticate it. Well, now you've, you've sold the grain off the crop, you either, and you're probably consuming your own fiber at, at the tonnage that we had listed here, at this 30 pound per acre, you've turned that into $4,900 an acre material. Now remember you've made a capital expense, you've got all those numbers to subtract from this, but this would be if keeping in consistent numbers of your per acre revenue, that's what it would be, all right? If you did gross revenue first mill decorticated herd, here's the second part of that. So this was fiber, this is herd. If you combine those two, and I'm sorry my formatting moved, I don't know why, but if you combine those two revenues plus the grain revenue of the 687 over here, yeah. you've turned that into $8,100 an acre. You know, now your, your cost to decorticate it is, is going to be, you know, several hundred bucks, but still there's, there's a number for you. Um, the next column, gross revenue, first fiber cleaned and herd sized uh, revenue per acre. Um, you know, this is just same, same kind of thing. I'm just cumulatively adding up those numbers for you so you can get kind of an overall picture um, in a nutshell. That's, that's kind of all I was going to show at the moment, and then we can go into those questions uh, for, the, for this, uh, where my questions go. But I just thought that'd be uh, good information for people to look at. Just something to think about. It's not perfect in every farming scenario. But, but there's something there for you to, to contemplate and think about when you're getting into this work. So hopefully that, that sparks some questions and we can go into the question part of this thing. Mandy, well, how do you wanna go from yeah. Let's just, I'll just read them off, Corbin, if you'd like. One of the sure. questions um, that we highlighted was best way to monitor crop health. Well, I, before you plant, I definitely would do all my soil sampling and uh, look at that and and you just the input is is similar to corn spring wheat etc and then you're going to start doing petiole samples uh, as you go through the season and monitor that and then you're going to work with your agronomy team that's in your local area and uh, come up with a plan I know there's there's some local 
uh, fertility companies in our area that have, have got some history on that and have learned. I'm sure there's a lot more around the country that have, have got their hands on it, but it's kind of a localized deal depending on which field you're in and, and what cultivar you're doing. And um, you just got to kind of keep working on it there with your local people. I'll ask a lightweight question. Uh, like in corn, the, uh, the drones have become real, real useful for corn. Is there, what's the uh, value of a, of a drone? I know there's some people using satellite imagery. I would assume that the drones have the ability to, you know, fly a field and, and look at fertility. And, you know, I don't, I, I don't know that much about the drones. Andrew Bish sells those and he could sure answer some more of that for us, but I'm sure thinking that's going to be a very viable uh, resource in the very near future if it's not already. I just haven't personally touched one. Awesome. Uh, another question, this is pretty big scale, but maybe a little bit sidewall. Wondering about the market view for hemp in 2021. Can you kind of speak overall to that? To, to me, overall, I mean, from a fiber and grain perspective, it's mm -hmm. still building. Um, we put and, and run our R&D decorticator in our shop. And we run large samples for people to help them launch their businesses because the offtake is not completely mature yet by any means, I would say. So we've been running, you know, animal bedding samples. We're doing some stuff for plastics, hempcrete. Uh, we've been sending fiber out to people. Uh, and, and that was the entire intent of us putting that facility. And the best of my knowledge, we're the only long line decortication facility running in the country at the moment. And we don't want to be processors. We want to build machinery. But we saw the need to get domestic grown and decorticated products in people's hands so that you can investigate your own business and launch your own businesses. And it just wasn't there. So we said, you know what, we're going to, we're going to, put, put this, the marker down and start doing it. And so far the response has been really great. Um, you know, and, it, and it's allowed us to take the machinery and refine it more, you know, almost every other day. We've increased the efficiency of our, of our smaller throughput line by 80% in the last eight to 10 weeks. Much, much happier with it. Some of the best long line fiber that, that people are saying when we send it out um, in the in the world, and, and we're being told that the herd that we're sending out for animal bedding, we can get pretty much all the fiber out of that herd, and then size it consistently to whatever you want. And uh, it's it's very very clean. We can get the dust out of it very well. So we've got some pretty neat techniques that we're doing uh, to to get to that end of it. But I think the outlook overall is going to be pretty decent in 2021. 2022, when these things start to solidify and mature a little bit, then we're going to start getting traffic. And then, you know, if you're not a, a member or support the Hemp Feed Coalition, that's a huge uh, component of this is getting grain accepted as animal feed. That, that changes the landscape of hemp farming and farming in general. So I don't know if people really understand or fully have recognized yet if we start growing million acres, two million acres of hemp, whether it's fiber, grain, et cetera, what's that do to the available acreage for corn, wheat, soybeans? It pulls acreage out of production that used to be in those traditional crops. Remember, I, my view of hemp is, is a great rotation crop. But if that rotation crop starts taking on more acreage, your other commodities should go up in price and make them even more viable in terms of revenue. So, you know, and you can farm hemp as grain and fiber, just like you do corn, wheat, everything else. So it's something to think Your of. Your rotation it's crop, is that every third year or every fourth year? Either one. I've seen both. I've seen back-to-back, -back, you know, you're traditionally told not to do that, but I've seen back-to-back -back, uh, crops in many places that work okay. Um, this, I'm not a huge fan of it, but hey, sometimes you got to do it. Uh, and I haven't seen any huge negatives. I've seen 100% volunteer fields come back. That it's amazing. Um, so, the, uh, hopefully... Eric just had a real quick question. He asked, "Does anybody mm -hmm. know numbers as far as how many acres are currently being grown in the United well, States?" Well, 2019 was 562,000 acres. The vast majority was was CBD oriented cannabinoid farming. Uh, last year was 450 ish, which I thought was on the high side. Now. 
I don't know how many of those got harvested. I, I'm told less than 50% of that was actually harvested. That mix of CBD to grain fiber definitely changed more towards the grain and fiber markets. Um, yeesh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I've know of several thousand acres of, of grain slash fiber or true fiber crops that were grown in the country. If you go to Montana, I think Montana had 15,000 acres alone last year down from over 100. And all of that 15 was, was pretty predominantly grain, uh, dual purpose grain crops. So that inversion is happening. And we, we can go back to a day in October when our inquiry switched from CBD focused to fiber focused. So yep, 22,000 acres, somebody said. Yeah, who knows what, it, yeah, next year. I'm, I'm glad to see acreage going down actually, because that's gonna help get these prices higher. Uh, there's still a glutton of inventory from 2019 and 2020 for CBD. And that's why if you look at pan exchanges numbers from last month, I think CBD uh, crude, winterized crude for Colorado was $105 a kilogram, down from 7,000 in 2019, January, 2019. That's pretty hard hit, but wow. supply, and, supply and demand works. Mm -hmm. um, so another question is using using hemp. I can't remember if, if you said are the red Corbett are the red questions you want to ask. Yeah, I wanted to get to those. Yeah. Okay. This one is using hemp resin to create flexible packaging. Um, okay. Any experience? This is an interesting one to me. I spent twenty five some odd years in packaging, flexible packaging, plastics. Um, I made non-wovens, I made knit materials. If you go into a grocery store, people get sick of me saying it, but I innovated all the mesh potato packaging, onion packaging that you buy in every store in the country. So that's why I started doing this because I wanted to do a plastics. And then we started working on it. Went, oh, crud, we got to figure out how to harvest it. Then we got to figure out how to break it down. And this was, you know, this is my fifth year, Neil. So we had to take a few steps backwards to get this going. But I delivered some product to a gentleman the other day that is a PhD chemist fella. And he is going to figure that out. Because if he can get me a true degradable resin pellet, I can make it into something pretty interesting. You know, it's just like the PLA cellulose materials. I tried for 15 years to find a true biodegradable package. I would never stick my name on it as biodegradable because the things like PLA makes good clamshell stuff, rigid plastics. We did not find one that would work for flexible, you know, blown film extruded because with non-wovens or the knit products, extensibility, tensile strength, things like that, you just don't allow it to be machinable if it's too rigid and too brittle. So I never found one that I would label one of our bags with, with a true degradable state on it. If this gentleman can do what he thinks he can, he, he's pretty confident in it to make a true resin pellet that when you put it outside in the parking lot, it turns back to hydrogen and carbon. Oh man, especially if we can drop it into the existing plastics infrastructure. If I can blow it into a film, I can make a potato bag out of it. To me, that, I mean, if that's what got me into this gig. If we can take virgin pellets and, like you say, use the current petroleum infrastructure to uh, to upscale it, then that saves a lot of cost. Huge. Yeah, no, nobody's going to put in specialized extruders at the moment uh, for something that, that is that high of risk. So like you're saying, if, if you can put it into any of the existing infrastructure, boy, does that open up some really exciting stuff. Now, what are your thoughts on the rec recyclability uh, or combining virgin hemp plastics with recycled uh, other plastics? I'm sure there's going to be avenues that, that, you know, it's all about the performance. So whatever that blended material will yield in terms of performance, if, if you've got an application, you know, like the, the park benches, they take a lot of recyclability, recyclable material and injection molded into parking structures or clips or, you know, all kinds of different stuff. That's, it's probably really, really viable as well. Um, we'll just have to see what the performance is. I, I just don't know uh, what what the end result is going to be and what these guys can do with that plastic uh, pe pellet, you know, that's made from the hemp. I'm really excited to see what the molecules look like and, and what they think they can do, but they're very confident in it. So we'll see. We've heard that before. So, but yeah, I definitely love to uh, connect and maybe uh, learn more about this uh, particular gentleman you're talking about. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. He's a university of Nebraska guy. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what he's come up with. Those corn huskers. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, and I don't think of Nebraska as, as a plastics engineering place. I mean, I, I was just like, like to say, I, I was a small consumer of plastics and I've been down to Freeport, uh, Texas, where they park those tankers out there and suck all the oil out of them. And you want to talk about a facility that is an impressive setup. I think they said there's 22 square miles where they where they bring the oil in and convert it into styrene. And then everywhere that plant is, they, the offshoots go into other facilities to refine it into, you know, the ethylenes, uh, propylenes, nylons, PETs, et cetera fascinating facility if you ever get bored and want to go to you know i'm a machine junkie so i like going to see machinery if you want to see machinery that is a fascinating place to see stuff um um so then we talk about another question that was highlighted or that you highlighted is in use of products instead of destroying you know one of the questions was what laws would we like to see changed and and being able to utilize mm -hmm products that may be hot or vice versa where do you see for options there and you know i I, th I think the regulators did what the regulators do best they let this go to the fda and the usda they missed the intent and the spirit of the farm bill which was to make hemp a commodity again mm -hmm. uh, to me it shouldn't be regulated unless it's going to direct consumer consumption kind of stuff anything to me if it's hot it should be allowed for, for remediation down into something else, you know, especially as this gets into larger scale farming. If you go out to the middle of Kansas and that guy's farming 10, 15,000 acres, there's absolutely no way he's going to intentionally put a plant in his field that is going to let him risk his farm. I just think the notion that that is the farmer's intent is to grow a hot crop on purpose. Because remember, they're all focused on CBD. And, and medical and me, uh, recreational use stuff. Industrial hemp, you know, soapbox time. The intent of that is not what, what those other products are, those other streams. It's, it's fiber and herd and grain for consumption of for human consumption, cattle, et cetera. But to me, it should only be regulated at the consumption state, the stock, the grain, everything else it's, it's, it's literally straw. If you come by our booth at NOCO or come to the shop and you put your hands in a, in a, in a sack of fiber, it looks and smells like straw. You can't see any difference. And I don't think there's any risk of, of getting goofy off of that. And I don't think any realistic farm is going to risk that is, is legacy to grow a couple extra percentage points. To me, the notion is nuts, but that's, that, that is what it is. I'm hoping uh, people recognize that and, and, and they will change their mindset at those legislative um, stages because it, it needs to happen. Otherwise, it's going to be tough to make it a commodity and really make long-term money at it. Yeah, absolutely. So out of all the advice and experience you've got, what would you say the three or what would you tell people that are potentially looking to get into the industry as well as investors that are looking to invest into the industry? Do your, do your homework, vet, vet where it's going, where it's going to make sure, you know, we, this is our fifth year. We still run into people that are not real. And I'm telling you, I've seen some of the best dog and pony shows you can imagine. And then they disappear. Um, make sure the it. checks. Yeah, it, laughing. <laughs> everybody wants to be in hip until it's time to write the check. Unfortunately, um, make sure you're getting paid. Don't risk your farm. Uh, like I said, we had a, a deal not too long ago. I said, I'm not subsidizing your, your work. If, if you want us to do the work, this is our price. This is what we're going to get compensated for it because this is what it costs us to innovate and do this stuff and, and keep me hiring people to keep our, our machinery running. So the farm, if the farm's not healthy in general, none of us are going to be too healthy very long. We have to have these farmers viable. Uh, we had a gentleman call not too long ago and told him what we we're paying per ton. He said, oh, it's too high. I said, I'm not going to go out and contract stuff for you if these farms are not making money at it. I'm not going to slap our name on it. It's just a bad thing to me. So I, I, I really want to protect these farms. I think really this is where I hope we're all on the same page and I really wholeheartedly believe we are as we've joined and linked arms to move this industry as it really comes back to our farmer. Um, yes. 
Susie, you had a great there's enough time. room in here. Yeah. Sorry, Mandy. If, if you look at the retail price for yard goods textiles, when somebody's taken a jacket and taken hemp fiber made it into a jacket, do this little exercise. Take that, look at the spec sheet, it says that coat weighs X. Figure out kind of what you think that fabric weighs. Take that number and figure out what it costs per ton and work it back to the seed. There's way huge amounts of money that can be shared back to these farms. And if you want to see it, come talk to me. I made textiles for a living for 20 some odd years. I know how to do the math. There's money here to be shared. I'm sorry, it is. It, it, there, there's money to be shared. Don't let them snowball you. Okay. There's yes. plenty to go around here. You know, like, you know, what happened to CBD in the last 12, 14 months? Did the retail price drop too to consumers? No. It didn't. So where'd that extra money land? Because the farmers didn't get it. So no. you, you can do that deduction on your own and figure out where the money stopped because it didn't make it to the farm. Otherwise, some of these farms wouldn't have gone broke. I don't know if you follow the machinery auctions, but some of the big name CBD guys had some really massive auctions in the last three to six months. Um, here's a real quick question that I've got a couple of more that I want to ask before I'll open it up for you guys. But Susie had a good question wondering about hemp based products if they're if we always need to be blending them or if it's going to need to continue to be blended with other products. And what does the timeline look like as we're moving from, you know, polycarbon blended to 100% hemp based plastic or Oh, in terms of plastics, or I was thinking like textile grade kind of stuff. I think stuff. anything on any of it, right? Is uh, we're it's going to be like everything. I'm sure there's a price point kind of break point, but you know, I, I can see a definite path to 100 percent, you know, hemp cordage or textiles. Um, it's going to take a little more work because most of the machinery. The infrastructure that is 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 in place today. I mean, our decorticators we built them so they could be dropped into upstream of the cotton infrastructure, so we can go down into the uh, uh, lint cleaning stage of a cotton gin, and then use all that equipment. To me, if that those are assets, I don't know if most people realize most cotton gins run for 100, 120 days and they stop. So there's available machine capacity that can be utilized. So instead of building a dedicated hemp facility, um, why not use some of that stuff? Point being is some of that cotton machinery is made for either 28 millimeter staple link fibers or 31 millimeter staple fibers. We've been bringing some in and adapting them to the long fibers. I mean, most of our stuff's been between 12 and 24 inches after we've cleaned it. Um, when it first milled decorticated, some of our stuff's five, six feet long. So long line fiber, to me, any long line fiber is anything over three inches. So a little bit of work on it is, is going to make that even easier. But at the moment, it's going to probably have to be blended so the machinery can accommodate those different fiber lengths. Hopefully that's asking the question. Same thing in plastics. You know, a true, a true biodegradable plastic, hemp-based plastic, this is a what if. What if after they've isolated this, these, these long chain molecules and made it into a resin pellet, what if it's brittle or rigid? Um, then it may have to be blessed, blended with an ethylene or something to make it softer if you need that performance or if you need elongation in that material to make it perform to what you're gonna do. Uh, even though it's not 100% hemp plastic, it's still a source reduction thing that is, is, is a step in the right direction. It may not be the 100% solution, but it's a step in the right direction. Everything takes time. It, 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 we want everything so fast anymore. It, it just takes time to figure that out. And a lot of time and effort and resilience and a lot of money sometimes. Yeah, um, I mean, we're building this industry from scratch, so. Zero. Patience. It doesn't exist. I mean, geez, even if, if it was that easy, you'd think some of the overseas people that have been uh, haven't been banned for 80 years would have solved all this and they haven't. So I, I still think we're, we're leading the way in some of this hemp textile and fiber and grain. I really do. They're not grain so much. The Canadians have been doing that forever. Somebody asked about paper. Um, the large grocery store retail people would like to get away from uh, t-shirt bags. HDPE t-shirt bags is 
I mean, they, they went out of there fast. And I don't blame them because if you drive by any Walmart, they're blown through the parking lot. Uh, paper packaging for produce is coming, potatoes, or apples, onions, oranges. Uh, I personally watched it and it is fascinating and it, it's going to work. Um, how is that applicable to hemp? The wood pulp paper that they're doing now works pretty decent, but it needs a little more fiber. I think it needs to have hemp fiber blended into it because I don't like its burst strength and its tear is, is marginal. It's functional, but it's, it's not as good as it should be to perform at some of the speed some of these guys want on their packaging machinery. So keep watching on the paper. I haven't posted anything on it yet, but I, I assume will be in the next few months. Very cool. Well, I'll open this up for you guys if you have any questions or any specific questions. Susie, is that your hand raised? Yeah, feel free. Go ahead and jump in. That You can use the icon down below, but go ahead and unmute yourself and I'll call on you. Thank you so much. Um, so please excuse the question that's going to come out because I am learning at a basic level right now, just exposed to many different areas. So I wanted to ask about the organic uh, versus the conventional that you were going through earlier in your numbers. Mm -hmm. I was under the impression that the organic farming was typically done for the consumables, for the CBD and nutritional medicinal aspect. But is there organic farming also happening for textiles because fabric is being made and it's gonna, it touches the skin and like hempcrete because we still wanna have, you know, clean housing with all the insulation. I just wanted to know if you would be able to clarify the organic versus the conventional, what they're actually being used for you know, it's kind of like organic cotton and conventional cotton i think they use a little bit of both so the hemp is going to come there i personally have not seen an organic uh, fiber field to know number one what its performance is or if it's going to command a different price point i, ju I just don't have an answer to that my assumption is is there's probably going to be a need and a, and a variable price point for an organic fiber I just haven't seen it yet. I my but my assumption is that's going to happen. Somebody's going to ask for it, and we're going to figure out how to grow it. It doesn't scare me personally. If I was farming it, uh, at the at the densities that you're putting that crop in, uh, from a weed perspective, I think you can plant it in, and, and if your your practices, your farming culture practices are pretty solid, that crop's going to canopy and choke off the weeds. Um, but weeds, you know, weeds are a problem in CBD farming. Uh, from an impurity standpoint, it's a major problem in fiber and herd farming because pigweed looks exactly like hemp when it's dry, but boy, does it not decorticate the same. It makes a mess if you get pigweed in there. So you have to be quite diligent on your weed control, uh, whether it's organic or conventional. And, you know, there's, there's not a lot of herbicides. There, there's some limited use herbicides coming around. So we'll have to see how that goes. Unfortunately, you're going to have to do something because face it, some places have huge weed pressure issues. Um, I was in fields that had broom weed that it was as tall or taller than the hemp. Talk about a challenge to farm, man, because that stuff is nasty. Same thing with pigweed, kochia. Uh, if you're growing for grain, uh, you got to contend with those seeds. We can get all that stuff out of there. We have grain cleaning equipment that can drop all that kochia and pigweed out. So it's doable. I am seeing an increased request for organic for fiber, especially on the non-wovens for feminine products or health and wellness, the medical side. Um, and then the, the way at which it's processed for the carting and the secondary processing, organic is tending, I'm, I'm finding a lot of requests for the organic there yep. or a lot of discussion about it. Um, mainly, like I said, around the type of textile that's being processed for but David, I saw you've got your hand raised. You're on mute. I don't know if. Yes. First of all, Corbett, thank you very much. You uh, Dave Rockwood here in Park City, Utah. We do quite a bit of work with napier grass in Southeast Asia, turned into pellets for the for power plants as mm -hmm. part of the Kyoto Accord to have a sustainable component in their coal burning. Do you know what the calorie and ash content of a hemp pellet is? I'm told the hemp, when it's pelletized, the ash content is between two and three percent. Um, again, I, I've not personally done it or seen test results, so this is third hand. I'm also told that its BTU uh, output is a little better than hardwoods, so oak awesome. or maple, etc. 
but that well, ash content is pretty interesting, I thought. Well, and, and would that be, would, could we do it with just the herd that's left over and, and still have those values, do you think, or not? I don't know if you can post the corticated price point wise, make that work. I don't know. I haven't studied it. Um, okay. You know, like a wood pellet for a stove, you know, you can buy that stuff for 200, 250 bucks a ton. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of it's kind of scrap stuff that they repelletize. Um, you know, if you're buying it for 150, 200 bucks a ton, that only gives you $50 to, to pelletize it to hundred dollars to pelletize it. And mm -hmm. I mean, it costs about 350, 400 on the lower end to decorticate. So it just depends. Now that's that's long line fiber corticating. If you hammer mill it, maybe it's a whole lot cheaper, but you can probably go straight into it. I just don't know. Yeah. Like I said, we're just trying to get another higher mm -hmm. value add from yeah. the waste. Okay. And yeah, now if you just take the waste, find the beer. Sure. Just some of the scrap process product out of the out of the decortication. That might be a very viable thing, but that's you know, we, we don't have a ton of scrap coming out of these machines. It's almost all utilized. So there may only be three to 5% that's what I would call pure scrap, maybe. So Understand. This, can you this match is the a volume? Project, this is a project that we're specking out mm -hmm. in Thailand. So I think, you oh, know, cool. they, they've just legalized and uh, we're part of an expansion. We're helping a lot of corn farmers and sugar cane farmers convert to industrial yep i'm not a, a pelletized expert hey. so i'm sure there's way better people to answer the question for you i don't want to pay hey dave uh if i can jump in i can give a little bit of info to dave sure um i did a test run on some hemp material and um it 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 does make a great pellet but essentially what you need is you need that uh, fiber, the lictin is the most important part because that is the binder in the herd. So you kind of need to be doing something like CBD uh, mm -hmm. stocks and just throw it all through the grinder and size it up and then you can feed it into the pellet machine. Um, and it, it does have some great properties. Um, I've also been looking at uh, combining wood uh, get a ratio of wood to hemp just because the one of the problems I see with uh, just hemp stock is the amount of feed stock that you can get um, and still profitability based on the transport and um, uh, I still am very intrigued by the hemp pellet um, it's uh, it's something that's coming. Thank you very much, sir. Real quick, when we were talking earlier, Dave, I'm going to call you out. If anybody has questions, there were some questions about monitoring crops and that some people are using satellites. Dave's been doing that for a number of years, monitoring crops all over the world, big ag um, from satellite to test all different aspects. And so reach out. I just wanted to give you a shout out before you got on, David. We were actually just talking about this topics and so um but yeah that's what we do so <laughs> awesome any other questions real i knew quick? somebody we're, did <laughs> yeah we're coming up on about an hour and i know that people are itching to get back to the conference um eric i saw you have your hand real quick grace real quick go ahead hey thanks a lot appreciate it um i was just curious i wanted to ask and see if maybe i could connect with david on the uh <clears throat> on the sense that um with the biostimulant i'm pushing for the sense of we, we have, uh, we've been using uh, concrete and using it as a biopolymer additive. And we think, and we know that the same molecule that we're working with can uh, be strung along in a single chain, very long physical single chain that we believe can be woven into, into textiles and other fiber uh, based products. Just wanted to ask on basically where, if he or someone he knows could probably help with the, with uh, creating this, uh, this textile material sample and then also testing its its strength and, and versatility kind of stuff. Yeah, we know. I still know people that that weave and knit. Just depends on which one you want to do. But you know, I don't know if Mandy threw out my email address. Send me a note. We can sure take a look at what you're talking about and and, and give you some help. Okay. Yeah, I'll send and you the testing too. 
you know, I send out all kinds of stuff for third party testing. I don't, uh, I'm not where I was when, when I, when I ran those non-woven plants, uh, but I had full labs there, but I know uh, third party labs and they're not very expensive. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's okay. I'll email you. Thank you. Okay. Let's do one more question if we've got time and then Corbett, I'll let you get back. I'm excited to meet with the rest of you. I'm going to hunt you down while you're here. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm Kevin. I saw you had your hand raised. Go ahead. Hey, Corbett. I, uh, I'm interested in finding out in facility uh, decortication versus portable. Mm -hmm. um, does it does portable make sense when dealing with transportation costs? Um, how how do you differentiate the better the better play? The first large machine we made, we put on a combine trailer because transportation is an issue. These machines are not massive. You know, it, it depends on what what you're you're needing. You know, if you're a textile guy and 75% of the crop is herd, you're not interested in that. Herd is a scrap product to you because your right. business is built around fibers, whatever that fiber may be. So you really don't want to contend with that. So the reason we built that first one to mobile was we can drag that machine out to a spot that, you know, is four or 5,000 bales, let's say. We can break that down into the fiber and into the herd. The herd is going to have one packaging and shipping method. The fiber we can compress and make much more dense and ship right. it to somebody that's interested in fiber. And then they don't have to contend with all the scrap because that's, that's, that's a non-value added process for them. The herd can go to somebody else, animal bedding, hemp creep, whatever, the plastics things, because they're not interested in the fiber. You know, an animal bedding guy, I don't know if people realize that the, the fiber is actually an irritant to the horses. Um, I think I've heard something similar to that in turkeys, et cetera. So again, it, that's a scrap thing. So why not segregate those in the field, make them in a, a more shippable form and get it to the people that want them. And then they don't have to contend with scrap or waste. Um, so that's why we built that machine like that. And, and I still think it's very viable, but we've made all our machinery at the moment is modular because the industry is still moving and, and learning where it should be. Uh, we made them so you can take things in and out of the, of the out of the system and do what you need for the people that you're talking to. If you don't need fiber textile grade fiber, why buy those extra pieces of machinery? Exactly. Our, our decorticator, the smallest one, run we've been running at 1.8 tons an hour, and it takes up 2,500 feet. That's that's nothing. And you know, even some of these big machines aren't running a whole lot faster than that. They're, you know, a factor of 10 more costly, and you can only do one or two things with them. We've been doing all kinds of different stuff with ours. Nice. So I think it's a very viable a solution is making these mobile. You know, I put it on a combine trailer. We were going to put an awning over it so that it can come out, fire suppression, and you sit there and you do the work, and when you're done, you move it. So I, I like it. Right. I like the idea of mobile as well. And that's kind of where I've been steering so, my research to. Um, we'd be happy to lot, do it because I like a it. A lot of the work that we're doing, it almost has to fit in a 40 foot container. <laughs> yep. So I can, because it's easier to move that to my farms throughout Thailand and Malaysia than it is right. to get the material to the process. Yep. Not, that's doable too. I, I put that first one on a combine trailer because I found one cheap. And I say combine grain cart combine because when you get there, you can slide the, the bottom rails out and we put a platform on it and you've got a, a working state uh, space. You know, those platforms are three to four feet wide and that's that's your work deck where your people are walking around on it. And then we oh. mounted the machine to, to the main frames. Works slick, still got it. Well. We were ahead. Of, you know, we worked on this fiber stuff for five years. Like I said we were probably four years too early, but we've always worked on it. CBD, you know, we made a lot of CBD harvesters and, and it funded all the R&D that we've done and got us to where we are in fiber at the moment. Um, we never stopped working on fiber. Awesome. Cool. Thanks well, for the input. Any Absolutely. Last any last feedback or anything for, from anybody else? I shared links for this next Next week, I want to give a shout out. Ohio um, FFA group is presenting to Capitol.
Hospital about industrial hemp and farming and will be doing a presentation for us on April 1st, all um, basically with the intent to pick our brains as experts on what they in the schools can do to move this along for our youth. And so I invite you guys to participate in that one as well. I shared the link below. Um, but Corbett, thank you so, so much for doing this. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. Th Amanda asked me a question. If you send me an email, I'd be happy to answer because you have a very good question there. Oh yeah, you're welcome. I didn't even see it. It, it scrolled out. I, I'm sorry, I'm not used to some of this, this chat thing on the side. I, if I look at it, I get distracted. <laughs> but she asked about, would you say North America is becoming more capable of processing raw, raw hemp and textiles as opposed to China, or I would even throw Canada? If I have anything to say about it, we're going to, we're going to win this deal with U.S. domestic made. Um, I made uh, the company I work for, we made the shade cloth for the PGA Tour, NASCAR, NFL, et cetera. Uh, we used to buy some of that. We started in the U.S. We ended up having to offshore some to China. Over the course of two years with our lean manufacturing processes, we brought all of that production back to the U.S. and beat them on quality, price, and delivery. And I see zero reason why I cannot do that with hemp production. I want to have some of this stuff. I've got material out being spun into thread now, all U.S. made. And like I said, if I have any way of influencing this thing, we're going to have some pretty phenomenal U.S.-based hemp products. Um, Corbett, I'm an old garmento. We're working on a uh, bamboo-hemp combo. Oh, that'd be fascinating. We've had people ask us to process bamboo, and I don't have access to bamboo in the mountains of Colorado. I would love somebody to send me some so I can decorticate it. Because our decorticators aren't just hemp. We can do flax, canaf, hemp. I think we can do bamboo. Somebody was going to send us a nice. banana leaves or cactus. But canaf and flax, we've done. Nice. Uh, great. I want to give a shout out to a couple people that are on this call that are here solely with the intent to connect our textile industry to our hemp. So Tom, please reach out to Corbett. Tom is extremely passionate and well connected on this to connect these in use. Um, and so part of what we're doing is focusing on just that Corbett is bringing these Beautiful. industry leaders that are not in hemp into or introducing these opportunities. And so wherever we can collaborate, I'd love to. Yep. Thank Last you. question Corbett, if you don't mind. Have yeah. you done palm silage? I have not. But I don't see why it would not work. So you can see I'm the Asia guy. Palm, uh, uh, bamboo, and now him. So I think we can do it. All from and, Utah. <laughs> and, and we can make those machines go in containers, <laughs> Dave. We engineer so they'll fit in containers, by the way. Because we've shipped machinery. The first decorticator we actually, no. Yeah, the second decorticator we built went to Russia. And then we've got machinery in Lithuania, England. Uh, we get inquiries from Asia, South Africa, South America. It, it's unfortunate the coronavirus hit or we'd already be doing a ton of work in South America right now. I can't get down there. All right. So. Tom, did you have a question or want to say anything I saw before we hang up? You were off mute for a minute. Uh, I, I was just type, typing you a uh, private message. I, I truly appreciate. I will be contacting Corbett. Uh, you know, I'm very impressed. Thanks, sir. Thank you. I'm glad. Great to job, Thanks, Andy, for having Thank me. You. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Good, and I like good talking stuff, about guys. this stuff. And anybody wants to reach out, uh, she threw yeah. my email in there somewhere. Please do. Yeah. And if you want to come to these shows and visit, come on up. We've got even more stuff to show you there. And um, there's just so much happening that is so fast here. It, it's fascinating. You know, my my work in the plastics industry and and printing and converting. Um, has, has let me bring in some stuff that I can't show you yet, but it's, you know, I've, I've found adhesives that I can bond this hemp together that are 100% degradable. And you know, let, your, <laughs> let your mind go from there. I've already hey. So I'm going to invite you and everybody that's not an active part of Global Hemp Association or our regular meetings. We host these on a regular basis. Please feel free to get involved. Corbett, I'd love to continue this conversation and support you guys. Um, anybody like I said, that's not on on a regular basis, feel free. Nice. Cool. Thank you, Mandy. Right. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for all your time and help. Thanks.
Thank you, have a good day. Thank you.